Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to VG Myths, the online internet video game TV show that always forgets to shuffle the deck. Kingdom Hearts Rechain of Memories is the long-awaited fifth game in the Kingdom Hearts franchise, reconverting GBA Chain from 2D beat-em-up back to 3D hack-and-slash. Clever use of the card-based battle system is required to progress, but as you should be well aware, I am incapable of speaking the word required without quotation marks. Can you you beat Kingdom Hearts Rechain of Memories with a one-card deck. There's only a single rule. With a fresh save file and starting from the moment the deck building mechanic becomes available, the player must reach the end of Sora's story with a deck whose total size is at most one. That's it! If the number of cards in your equipped deck follows that singular rule, you can do absolutely anything you want. With the rule set, let's get this run started. Just to make absolutely sure nobody gets any silly ideas, yes, we are doing the tutorial normally. That's why the one rule specifies that the run starts after we gain access to deck building, which is immediately after entering the first save room. Once you have access, go ahead and make any one card deck you want. Except that one. You're terrible at this. Turns out there's a secret second rule implemented directly by the game. A deck is only legal if it contains at least one attack card. Our starting inventory limits that one card to the Kingdom Key, the weakest of all attack cards, but every world you progress to will open up more attack card choices. The only stat that really matters between them all is the Strike stat, which determines the base damage of basic attacks. Whenever you get a stronger Keyblade card, make a Moogle Room and farm it for both a Zero variant and a relatively high value variant. Without going into too much detail, higher valued cards counter lower valued cards, briefly stunning the prior cards user. Zero is a special exception, automatically countering any other value at the moment of play. For basic Heartless, equip a high value variant and grind. Trust me, there's gonna be a lot of grind. With only a single card, our DPS is ludicrously pathetic. We only get the one attack from our one card before having to reload, done by manually charging the reload card. Incredibly thankfully, Donald and Goofy are here to help speed up the process. Just because we're playing with a one-card deck doesn't mean we're limited to just one card. Friend cards representing your current party members have a random chance of dropping every time an attack hits an enemy. Donald will cast two random spells, and Goofy will perform Goofy Tornado. Goofy is almost always preferable, usually clearing out a few Heartless all on his own. And if you're wondering what Pluto does, he doesn't. Beating random Heartless battles will give us both the map cards necessary to progress and, you're not gonna believe this, experience points. If you aren't a bad person, you might remember from the GBA Chain video that there are three level up bonuses to choose from, a max health increase, a max card point increase, and a new slate attack. Card points allow us to put more cards in our deck, slates allow us to combine multiple cards from our deck for special attacks, and health allows us to not die. Take three guesses which one I recommend. Those health increases will be incredibly important for this run's main events, the boss fights. Since bosses all have pretty long health bars, you'll be fighting each one for a ridiculously long time, and during that period you absolutely cannot afford to get hit. Without the ability to equip healing cards, the only ways to heal are with a Donald card or a Pluto card. And let me tell you, if you thought Donald was unreliable, you do not want to see Pluto's heal rate. It's best that's just to assume that every time you take damage, that health is gone permanently. You'll need to memorize every single boss's moveset in its entirety. Against the first boss, Guard Armor, focus on its legs. They have an attack that will chase after you for a surprisingly long amount of time, being both dangerous and an annoying time waste. Once it's down to just its body and head, it will start a spinning stomp attack. Hug close to a wall while rolling. Guard armor isn't legally allowed to be too near the wall, giving you more room to breathe. The rest should be easy. Immediately after, in the floor one exit, is Axel. This essentially functions as a tutorial for humanoid bosses, who have their own decks shown in the bottom right corner of the screen, and, just like Sora, are capable of executing multi-card slates. When facing any bosses who can use slates, you absolutely must bring in a zero card. These attacks are usually too dangerous to dodge, in some cases being outright undodgeable. Countering before the attack is executed is your only option. 
For that reason, you must absolutely never put yourself into a situation where your zero card is out of reach. Before actually attacking, preemptively charge up your reload as far as you can get while still technically not being fully filled. Once done, that's your cue to attack, after which you can reload instantly and have your card at the ready. Axel only has a single straightforward standard attack, so if you keep breaking his slates, he'll be easy. The next few worlds are mostly a breeze, until we abruptly slam our faces into one of the hardest boss fights in the entire franchise. The card friggin' soldiers. I'm serious. These guys are absolutely unrelenting death machines that give Sephiroth a run for his money. In a normal playthrough, you wouldn't notice since you'd just mash the attack button until everybody's dead. But if you give them any downtime, which we inevitably have to in order to reload, they'll go on the offensive. The spade cards carry an axe, and this axe attack is just straight up broken. They charge at Sora, swinging the axe over and over and over and over again, requiring you to dodge roll over and over and over and over again, and have you noticed that he's not stopping? And the moment the attack ends, they're just gonna do it again! You have zero time to breathe! I was genuinely questioning whether this run was possible or if I'd have to throw in the towel because of this stupid joke filler mini boss. Your only hope of survival is to counter. In between every dodge, you have a very, very small window in which you can charge your reload just slightly. Get into a perfect rhythm and be extremely careful when officially finishing the reload. For whatever reason, when Sora successfully performs a reload, he becomes incapable of moving for a fraction of a second. This will screw you over if performed at any time other than the earliest possible moment. Whenever a friend card drops, go ahead and use it ASAP they'll give you a huge amount of progress. Once the first wave of spade cards are gone, you'll face the second wave, two heart cards. Thankfully, they're an entirely different breed of hell. Heart cards have a single jabbing spear attack they'll spam over and over and over. The attack lasts too long for dodge rolling to be viable, except at the very edge of their range, and even then, be careful. The soldiers tend to push each other around, often accidentally extending the range of the spear attack. Most of the time, you should hop over the attack, which unfortunately leaves you with little time to reload. Play a lengthy game of keep away while getting small reloads in between, and very, very eventually you'll take out both hearts and enter the third and final wave, three heart soldiers and two spade soldiers simul friggintaneously. As you can probably imagine, this is ludicrously impossible. Both types of cards are dangerous on their own, but when either type could potentially attack you at any moment, the fight becomes an incredibly unfair funny joke. That's why you should save any Donald or Goofy cards that drop in Wave 2. Let them loose and aim specifically for the spades. With them gone, there'll only be one suit to worry about, so get back to the same dodging strategy as before. If you can keep consistent enough and get lucky enough friend drops, the card soldier battle is indeed somehow possible. Our next point of interest is Hell. Monstro features the boss fight against Parasite Cage, whose gimmick is a pool of acid which immediately damages damages Sora on contact. Just to make this as frustrating as possible, the four circling platforms will sink into the acid if Sora stands on them too long. And to make things even more frustrating than is supposed to be possible, Parasite Cage has both a giant poison ball ranged attack and melee attacks with such a huge range you're likely to be hit by them immediately after you deal damage yourself. Donald and Goofy aren't going to be that helpful either because of an incredibly stupidly frustrating detail of this game's design. While a friend card is in play, for some unfathomable reason, Sora is not allowed to jump. Meaning, if you use a friend card here, you will automatically take damage. To safely get damage in, all of your attacks need to be card breaks, temporarily stunning Parasite Cage and giving time to escape. When a gimmick card spawns, you can use it to temporarily drain the pools, giving just enough time to safely summon a friend. With some very cautious and precise play, we finally defeat Parasite Cage and can move on into hell. What, did you think that was it? Parasite Cage is only the hell mid-boss. The actual boss is a dumb, stupid minigame. 
To complete this minigame, we need to fill the constantly depleting bar in the top right of the screen by defeating tons of Heartless under a two minute time limit. As you can probably imagine, the only valid strategy is blind luck, specifically for friend card drops. To maximize drop chances, aim your Keyblade Strikes to hit multiple shadows with each swing. Each individual hit is one more roll of the friend dice. Also, make sure to grab those friend cards ASAP. Only one friend card can bounce at a time, so any hits dealt during such time are wasted. When you're approaching the 30 second mark, unleash your army of goofs and ducks and hope for the best. Even even if this run got good drop luck, they may not thin the crowd in exactly the way the game wanted to, failing to fill the bar. And as I found out absolutely crushingly after several wasted hours, no, basketball rules do not apply. If you fill the bar slightly after the timer hits zero, the Dumbo card reward will spawn, but then the screen just fades out like it never happened. This will be a terribly boring and frustrating several hours long time sink, but I assure you, eventually, you will appease the apparent RNG god Monstro and escape. Those hours won't be completely wasted, though. This minigame does not treat failure as a game over. That means all the EXP you obtain in each failed attempt is still legally yours, so by the time you beat it, you'll have a massive boost to your health bar. The final world of the first set, Halloween Town, is a very welcome break, with possibly the easiest boss in the entire game, Oogie Boogie. His attacks are so infrequent and difficult to get hit by, if you manage to lose, it's because your bathroom break took too long. After that very, very, very short break, get back in that pool of lava right friggin' now. We're heading into yet another of the hardest bosses in the entire franchise, Larsheen. Larsheen has three standard attacks. In one attack, she'll throw out two sets of kunai one after another lightning fast, best dodged by jumping above both volleys. In a second attack, she'll chase you down with a two-hit melee combo, best dodge with two dodge rolls. Making things tricky, the timing on these dodge rolls is different. The first roll needs to be done late, while the second needs to be done early. And in her third attack, she hits you with lightning. If you're wondering how to dodge it, you clearly weren't paying attention. She hits you with friggin' lightning! It is technically possible not to get hit by the lightning with a few dodge rolls, but as far as I can tell, it's entirely a matter of luck. In between your invulnerability frames, Larsheen is fully capable of hitting you if she wants, and usually she enjoys when things get hit by lightning. And since this is one of Larsheen's standard attacks, which she'll be using incredibly frequently, we have no hope of actually countering her every use of it. This battle is under a soft time limit. No matter how good you are at dodging, if you take too long, Larsheen will kill you. And to make matters about 50 times worse, once Larsheen's health is low, she'll enter Phase 2, where her melee attacks are upgraded to an ultra-deadly 5-hit combo. And the fifth hit is Lightning! Don't even bother trying to fight her until you head back and grind your health up to its literal maximum. At first, you'll want to actually win Heartless Battles to stock up on map cards, but once your map cards are near full, which they will be before we're done, create a friend card room. Attack a Heartless in the overworld to enter battle, hope for a Goofy or Donald drop, use it, grab the EXP that drops, and bid these suckers a temporary farewell, before immediately beginning the battle once again. A friend card is guaranteed to drop every time a battle begins, so exiting and re-entering ensures every attack will be a room clearer. With your health bar far larger than any reasonable developer could have expected, run back for the most hellish grind you will ever participate in. Since her lightning is automatically draining our health, you don't have any room for error. You must dodge her kunai and melee attacks flawlessly. As for the lightning itself, just dodge roll around mindlessly and hope for the best. I genuinely have no better advice. For any attempt to have a hope of being possible, not only will Larsheen have to decide to miss you with the lightning on a semi-frequent basis, you'll need enough Donald and Goofy cards of sufficiently high value to spawn in by the time you reach Phase 2. The moment you reach Phase 2, unleash every friend card you've got in a sequence of slates, starting with Donald since Donald is potentially capable of healing you. I will warn you, however, that Donald is Donald. 
With astronomically unfathomable RNG, you'll survive to phase two, friend cards will drop, Donald will not stab you in the back, Lurchine will make the active decision not to counter Donald or Goofy, and all those cards combined will actually deal enough damage to bring Lurchine's health bar to zero. This singular battle delayed the video by a week. And it's only the halfway point. In Atlantica, we fight Ursula, who will be a much more reasonable but extremely long endurance battle. You can only hurt her when she's directly next to the arena. She'll come on her own after you kill a few tentacles, but that only provides enough time to safely deal a single hit. If you try to hit her while countering attacks, her head will bounce slightly out of range. More lucrative is when a gimmick card drops, providing you enough time to hit her twice. Thankfully, Ursula's own attacks are mostly harmless since she takes so long to actually perform them. Attack the tentacles from a safe distance and be proactive with your reloads, and after about half an hour, Ursula will finally go up in smoke. At the floor's exit, we'll fight Riku. His moveset is a little difficult to get the hang of at first, but both his main attacks can be dodged by jumping every time he approaches, and while it doesn't work all the time, you have more than enough health to make up for it. It was at this point that I finally realized, however, that going through the worlds in the proper order is for dumb, stupid idiots, moving to Hollow Bastion instead. Specifically because Hollow Bastion's signature attack card is Levian Rose, featuring the highest physical attack power of all attack cards available before beating the game. We'll now be dealing the maximum possible amount of damage to bosses with our Keyblade Strikes. It'll come in handy when fighting Hollow Bastion's boss, Maleficent's Dragon Form. While her attacks have massive range, the arena is equally massive, and she's incapable of following you to the edge, meaning you're safe there from everything other than fire and shockwaves. Hug the wall and make carefully timed approaches and counterattacks to officially earn the right to take Levi and Rose with you to the rest of the game. In this floor's exit, we'll meet a familiar face, Riku 2. In addition to having a longer health bar, Riku is now capable of performing a jumping slate, and his standard overhead jump attack now produces a split shockwave along the ground. It's honestly not really that much of an upgrade, and you should still be able to outlife him just fine. The next two floors are Neverland and the Hundred Acre Wood, one of which is easy and the other is a nightmare beyond comprehension, but only for moral reasons. Worth noting, entering Neverland adds Glide to Sora's base movement. While slow, it's particularly useful in extending Sora's mid-air time to dodge grounded attacks. After both is the boss battle against Veshin, about which I will say literally nothing because I forgot to record it, and Veshin 2 is the next paragraph. In advance, we'll be doing a little prep. First, throw Kingdom Hearts Rechain of Memories in the trash and begin the one-card challenge in the Bunch of Days cutscene compilation. With exactly zero cards in our deck, the Kingdom Hearts Bunch of Days one-card run is mission complete. In fact, it's an ultimate mission complete, because through clever abuse of some little-known skips, I managed to beat a bonus challenge, completing this cutscene compilation without watching a single cutscene. With the franchise's canon play order thoroughly demolished, head back into Halloween Town and finally open the Room to Rewards with a Key to Rewards card, which you've probably obtained by now. Recognizing our popcorn-munching prowess, this room will now contain the Bond of Flame attack card, featuring the highest possible attack stat with the caveat that it deals fire elemental damage. Most bosses are resistant to fire damage, except Veshin thanks to it countering his ice element. Use Twilight Town's new Moogle card packs to obtain a zero value version, then run to the floor's exit and jam it into Veshin's face for less damage than Levi and Rose. You will be just as flabbergasted as me, and you deserve to. Everybody deserves to. See, turns out when they were making this remake of Chain of Memories and copy pasting magic resistance stats across all the bosses, they presumably presumably accidentally made the Iceman resistant to fire. Oh, but don't worry, they didn't forget everything. They remembered to make Ice heal him. With an hour of your life thoroughly wasted, voice some profanities while equipping Levi and Rose, and finally actually fight Veshin. The same general rules apply while dealing damage. Always attack with a card break from as far as you can get away with. 
It's worth noting card breaks are explicitly required here, thanks to Veshin's shield, which can only be attacked past with card breaks and fire elemental attacks. To dodge his ranged icicle attack, dodge roll forward and slightly to the side, then stay within that general area as the icicle tries its hardest and fails pathetically. Be ready to run if Veshin approaches you. If he gets too close, you won't be able to dodge a potential attack. The real danger will be Veshin's slates, which he uses frequently. One has such a long startup that I genuinely have no idea what it does, while the other is a quick trail of chasing ice pillars which can combo you for tons of damage. Careful on the counter, the ice pillar's hitboxes linger after the attack, so even if you counter it, you can still take damage by passing over their prior location. This is a bit of an endurance battle since Veshin's enemy card will effectively give him two bonus health bars, but with proactive reloads and, as always, a few extra health bars shaved off with Donald and Goofy, you'll eventually succeed. Next up is a familiar, familiar face, Riku 3. We can no longer easily outlife him. This battle will take genuine effort. His charge attack is now upgraded with a projectile, and he has a second slate, Dark Fyraga. Your number one priority should be preventing yourself from ever getting hit by his charge attack, which has a random stun chance locking you in a ridiculously over-the-top unfair combo. When dealing damage, as I hope you've gotten used to, only attack Riku with a counter, and always from the furthest distance you can get away with. Just like with Larshin before, I couldn't possibly hope to dodge everything, and banked my entire strategy on a roll of the friendship dice, getting Donald and Goofy to cheese me past phase two right as my health went critical. Gosh, gamer champ! Every single human being in the universe conglomerates in the comment section. Your dumb, stupid clickbait title had me thinking this would be a one-card run! Isn't using Donald and Goofy cheating? No worries, Sora's been thinking the same thing, so in the next cutscene, he tells Donald and Goofy he's had enough of their stupid friendship bull and runs back to tell Riku that Naminé is a mother of and, quite frankly, silly. Welcome to Riku 4! All of Riku's attacks are in their strongest forms. He has access to all of his slates from the beginning of the battle, including Dark Aura. His health bar is longer than it's ever been. Donald and Goofy are drowning themselves in breakup ice cream. I still have no idea how to dodge his attacks, and the run is over. That's it, the end. Upon reaching Riku 4, I immediately realized that there was absolutely no way I could possibly beat this boss fight with only a single card, and that to even entertain the idea with any degree of sincerity would inevitably trigger my incredibly unhealthy inability to turn the game off. So, as much as it pained me, I ultimately made the decision to respect my own well-being. So anyway, it's one week later, I hate my life, here we friggin' go! Since we have no reliable way of healing ourselves, every point of damage we take is permanent. Riku is in the same position, so logically, when doing the math on paper, to win this battle, we need a dodging strategy that, on average, prevents Sora from taking a larger percentage of damage over time than Riku does. Without friend card DPS boosts, we're nowhere close with our prior strats. First off, we need a method that deals damage to Riku, while while allowing us to escape a potential follow-up attack with 100% reliability. After many hours of experimentation, I realized Riku only ever attacks while he's facing Sora. That means attacking Riku's backside buys time while he turns around. Riku ever conveniently stops on the spot for a second after doing an overhead shockwave while he waits for the wave to dissipate. His card is still legally in play during this period too, giving even more escape time from the card break. By the way, always wait a short moment after attacking before you reload. If you reload while the attack card is discarding itself, it won't technically be reloadable yet, thus completely wasting the reload. Now that we can deal damage without taking damage, we'll also have to avoid damage without taking damage. After many, 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 many hours of experimentation, I found a strategy that almost always works. For most of the battle, Riku will run towards you and use either his charge or overhead attack when he's within a certain distance. To reliably dodge either attack, give Riku a little bit of time to approach, then jump with perfect timing as he breaches his attack threshold. Even if you get the timing, you're still not safe yet. You'll have to watch for which attack he uses and react accordingly. It's difficult to describe how to react, though. It's honestly more muscle memory than vanilla memory. 
Basically, I try to wiggle around him in a circle just slightly, but not too much, but sometimes a lot. He also may not even take the opportunity to attack immediately, stalling while he fumbles through his deck looking for a card he likes. You'll have to improvise a bit, but whatever happens, try to lead Riku around in a circle. Don't forget, you have the ability to glide and stall your fall. You'll also need to dodge his slates. Keep an eye on Riku's currently stocked cards in the top right corner of the screen. The specific slate can be determined by the first stocked card. If he stocks a card with a green background, he's prepping the jumping attack, Helm Split. If he stocks a card with a blue background, he's prepping Dark Fyraga. And if he stocks a red card, he's prepping Dark Aura. Note that Riku is capable of canceling his current stock. Pay attention so you aren't caught unawares. Helm Split is easily dodged in its entirety by jumping and gliding, but to get as much DPS as possible, you can instead dodge roll and charge reload between each attack, finally jumping and gliding over the third one. Dark Fyraga you'll need to be particularly prepared for. If you jump too high immediately prior, you'll get hit by the fireball before you can land and dodge. Finally, Dark Aura, thanks to its incredible danger, is the simplest. Always counter it, even if you're not close enough to hit Riku. If you see that Dark Aura is Riku's next slate, I highly recommend holding off on any attacks. If he uses Dark Aura a couple times in a row and you don't have reload time fully prepped, you will have effectively forfeited the battle. Even with a dodge strategy as perfect as I think I could reasonably perform, and with our own DPS being min-maxed as high as I could get it, Riku's DPS still surpasses our own, making the battle still theoretically unwinnable. There is, however, one more strategy we can work in to even the odds. If our DPS isn't good enough even at our best, then we're just gonna have to put Riku at his worst. As any decent Chain of Memories player should remember, Riku follows the same rules as the player. When he performs a slate, the first stocked card is made permanently unwinnable reloadable. That means the more slates we dodge, the smaller a deck Riku has to work with, and the more frequently he'll reload. While this is a minor boost to our own DPS, the real golden lining is that as Riku's deck gets shaved down, he'll become more and more hesitant to attack even if he has the opportunity, since, as mentioned before, he'll only attack if he finds a card he likes, which keeps getting harder and harder. That means while we start the battle with a lower DPS than Riku's, over time, the situation will reverse. And with a sufficiently hesitant Riku, I've even been capable of going long stretches of the battle without taking damage. In order for this strategy to work, there's one more important note. Riku has five one-time use elixir cards, which will restore all the cards he previously sacrificed, effectively resetting his DPS to its highest. You must counter all five elixirs to prevent Riku from bouncing back. Not only does this require quick reaction on your part, it also requires a little bit of luck since he'll sometimes use these elixirs one after another too fast for you to counter. And that's it. That is everything I know about Riku. The rest is up to you.
save your game, save your game, save your game. <laughs> no, I don't care. If my power goes out, screw it. I'm cheating. I'm announcing to the entire world that if my power goes out right now, I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna redo the fight with a million cards and just say, you know what, whatever, who cares? I'm just gonna like, go, I'm just gonna pretend Z's that I, that I did it here because I did do it. If it's fine. Who cares? I did it. I did it. With Riku 4 defeated, frantically run back to celebrate by saving the game, talk to Riku, and enjoy the realization that you will be fighting the next boss immediately, Larsheen 2. Before the battle even begins, pause the game, walk to the grocery store, buy two tubs of ice cream, eat one while failing to hold back tears, then walk to Disney headquarters, beat up the entire security team, interrogate them for the key code to the underground vault, perform an eldritch ritual on Walt Disney's corpse, hand the resurrected monstrosity the second tub of ice cream, and tell him to give it to Donald and Goofy along with a heartfelt apology note forged in Sora's handwriting. Walk back home, unpause the game, and breathe a sigh of relief as Donald and Goofy forgive a perplexed Sora and enter battle with the trio united. As I'm sure you suspect, even with Donald and Goofy, Larsheen 2 is practically impossible. She's now got a buffed up deck, a way bigger health bar, and if you even manage to survive long enough, a similarly ultra deadly phase 2 where she'll start using an instant automatic death slate. But you'll never get that far because she's still got her same old lightning attack and we still have no way to dodge it. This battle is practically impossible with our prior Strat, so I took on a new strategy never before seen on VG Myths. I put out a bounty. Anybody who could find a reliable method to dodge Larsheen's lightning would win five random steam keys for my baggie of extras, with a near guarantee that all five games would be unforgivably horrid trash. Believe it or not, this incredible prize did nothing to help. Nobody claimed the bounty. As far as humanity knows, Larsheen's lightning is just plain undodgeable save for the incredibly unreliable strategy of politely asking her to miss. Once again, we just have to accept that as this battle goes on, you will automatically take damage over time. The only way to win is to keep that damage drain lower than the damage you deal out. In order to do that, we can't afford absolutely any damage from any source other than Larsheen's lightning. First, dealing damage to Larsheen with our prior strats was safe-ish, but not 100% consistent, putting ourselves at risk of a counter-counter attack even with ideal positioning. Unlike Riku, Larsheen will rarely turn her back towards you, so backstabbing is a no-go. I did some experimentation and discovered I'd been playing this game wrong the entire time. I'd been playing my attack card normally by pressing the confirm button. But alternatively, you can stock your attack card and use it in a single card slate. This seems like it would be both completely pointless and detrimental, making that singular card unreloadable, but both are false. Remember that secret rule that the player must always have at least one attack card in their deck? In order to ensure the player never runs out of options, even if they're literally trying, if the player slates their final attack card, it will not be made unreloadable. That means we can slate our attack card with no penalty. As for why we'd even bother, see the comparison on screen. On the left, we play our attack card the normal way, and on the right, we play the same card via single card slate. Presumably to make slates go by faster, the card will be removed from play far sooner, and Sora will likewise be given back his freedom of movement far sooner. As long as we attack Larsheen with single card slate card breaks, we're at absolutely zero risk of a counter. This discovery was ludicrously huge, making beating Larsheen vaguely kind of sort of feasible. Next up is minimizing damage when Larsheen is on the offensive. Since we can't actually dodge Larsheen's lightning, we'll be doing the next best thing, basing our entire strategy on preventing her from using lightning in the first place. Since she's capable of comboing these lightning attacks quickly, we'll need to bait Larsheen into wasting time, during which we can charge our reload. Stick relatively close close, but not too close to Larsheen, and pay close attention to her deck in the bottom right corner of the screen. 
While it's not a guarantee, Larsheen will frequently play the currently selected card as her next attack, and the cards behind it are likely soon after. If Sora is within a certain range when Larsheen plays a green background throwing knife attack card, she'll harmlessly backflip before the throw, giving you plenty of time to charge reload and dodge. If she uses a blue background attack card, she'll perform her melee attack combo. If you are properly positioned, you'll have just barely enough time to react. Important note, you'll have a little bit of time to charge up reload in between hits. When she finally plays a dreaded lightning card, counter it while close enough to deal damage. If she uses too many in a row, dig into your stockpile of Pluto cards. An equal value card is ideal, negating the lightning without actually summoning Pluto. If you have to summon him, it's still usually worth it though, especially a high value Pluto which is less likely to be countered. Obviously, if you've run out of counter options, mash the dodge roll button in the hopes Larsheen decides to miss. While preparing to counter lightning is the crux of our strategy, don't be too stingy with your attack cards. If you're fully charged and Larsheen's magic cards aren't visible in her deck, go ahead and get some extra damage in. You'll usually have enough time for a full reload before the next lightning. Both her phase one slates have huge wind-up times, so you won't need to learn them. After many, many, many hours of practice, I reached a point where I could reliably reach Phase 2 in almost every attempt. Phase 2 has two differences. First, like in the prior battle, her melee attack is hugely upgraded, now consisting of four melee hits and finishing with a small lightning drop. The second two hits have similar dodge timing to the first two, and the lightning is much more likely to miss than her actual proper lightning attack. So while there's a much larger risk if you mess up, successful dodging will give you even more reload time for free. Larsheen's second Phase 2 upgrade is the Teleport Rush Slate, which is so astronomically dangerous you need to be ready to counter it instantly or else you will automatically forfeit. She has too much health to blaze past Phase 2 in its entirety, but as always, we're still banking on getting some major damage in with Donald and Goofy. Try to slate them when Larsheen has exhausted a good portion of her deck and is close to reloading. The less cards she has in her deck, the less likely she'll throw out a zero. With absolutely astronomically ludicrously perfect play, you will finally get just barely good enough at video games to turn the tables and prove to Larsheen that she too has a small chance of getting hit by lightning. If you made it this far, congrats! You've officially beaten what is in the running for hardest boss fight I have ever partaken in my entire life. This battle caused me actual, genuine, physical harm, inflicting me with hand pain that prevented me from even holding a controller, which only mostly went away after a full month of rest. The good news is, you won't be facing anything anywhere near as difficult in the remainder of this run, but the bad news is, it's not gonna be a victory lap. Enter the game's final 13th floor, Castle Oblivion. You can and should skip absolutely all random Heartless battles with your stock of map cards. Just rush to the story rooms to continue this final boss gauntlet. Axel 2 is laughably easy and basically unchanged since the tutorial. But in the final room, you'll fight the penultimate boss, Hollow Marlouche. While this battle occurs in a larger arena than usual, that does not mean you'll have more space to dodge. For one of Marlouche's three main attacks, he fires two sets of arcing homing laser slices, which cause ludicrously over-the-top damage and are difficult to dodge reliably. However, if you pay attention, you'll notice there's a blind spot. These lasers arc in opposite directions before joining together. If Sora is positioned within this sweet spot, each laser will harmlessly scrape past. For the duration of this battle, keep yourself within that sweet spot. He'll do his best to awkwardly sidestep in your general direction to throw off your movement, so be extremely careful. Moving even slightly to the side will put you in range. Otherwise, you have two attacks to watch out for. The first, Circle Reject, has Marluche summon three spinning vortexes which are practically impossible to dodge normally, but also have a far stupider blind spot. As soon as Marluche Cast Circle Reject, reject the circles by tucking yourself in a corner of this rectangular room, saved by the power of geometry. 
This can put you in a risky spot after, since you're no longer in the laser sweet spot. If he throws them, dodge with two dodge rolls in opposite directions. His third standard attack is what I like to call Circle Embrace. He'll dash toward you and attack with a painful melee combo. At first, I couldn't dodge this because the exact timing at which Marluxe would begin the combo felt random. Sometimes he'd attack immediately, while others he'd delay a second. Eventually, though, I realized what was going on. Marluxe will only begin the combo when Sora is facing directly toward him. Knowing this, embrace the circle and start ballroom dancing! Marluxe is surprisingly talented at following your lead, allowing for infinite rotation. This can be used in two ways. First, if you vary your rotational speed, you can gradually move in whatever direction you choose. If you're not comfortable at your current location, drag Marluxe closer to one of the edges, thus giving you more space to retreat. Second, it allows you to manually end the dance, followed by a perfectly timed backwards roll to bait and dodge Marluxe's attack. Now that we've got each of Marluxe's standard attacks down, we only have to worry about his slates. The one to look out for most starts with a magic card, causing Marluxe to teleport directly next to Sora and instantly attack. Always be aware if Marluxe has one of these prepped, and counter it slightly instantlier. His other slates have longer wind-up time, so you should be able to counter them without issue, including his Phase 2 Super Duper Slate, which I genuinely have no idea what it does, because I never needed to bother. With Hollow Marluxe defeated, save the game once again, and enter the true final boss battle, Vanilla Marluxe, split into two phases, which are themselves split into two phases. As a breath of fresh air, there, phase 1 is easy to learn, with Marluxe always cycling between the same attacks in a specific order. Don't bother attacking the scythes, the only benefit to doing so is preventing this singular scythe attack, which is so easy to dodge it doesn't matter. Lock on to Marluxe himself and deal damage between his attacks. When he summons flower turrets, he'll start with 3, and 1 will disappear each time you break one of his cards. The full set is difficult to dodge, so get your card ready to counter the first, reload, and counter the second jumping up near Marluxe in the hopes of dealing damage along the way. With only a single turret left, you should now be able to dodge easily, letting you catch up on reloads. When Marluxe takes control of the camera, if he summons a pink orb, Sora will take automatic damage upon the attack's conclusion. If he summons a dark orb, Sora will suffer a fate worse than damage. Every single card in your deck will be shrouded in darkness. Oh no! Upon reaching Phase 1, Phase 2, Marluxe's scythes will automatically suffer from an apparent critical design flaw, replacing them with two new attacks. First, a charge attack which you can invulnerability frame through with a properly timed dodge roll. Second, a less dodgeable ground pound. Just focus on reloading and counter at the last possible moment. If done properly, you'll always be able to counter. With both phases of Phase 1 down, our health is refilled and we enter Phase 2, Phase 1. True Final Marluxe. At first glance, he appears to be easy, since you can whittle down his health super quick until you encounter his 666 slate, Death Sentence. If you allow Death Sentence to activate, you'll be forced into a duel, requiring six counters under a six second time limit. You are allowed to reload, but that won't be enough with a singular card, meaning you are doomed. And there's no checkpoint here. If you die in Phase 2, you have to repeat Phase 1 to get another chance. When Marluxe uses Death Sentence, he'll always cast it in sets of three. You should be able to counter the first two, but the third you'll have to dodge. To do this, stick right in front of Marluxe's face and run around in circles waving your hands in the air. This works sometimes, but if it doesn't, you're just gonna have to hope you accidentally picked up a few Plutos, Donalds, and Goofies. Expend only as many of these as you need to survive. You might need them for another death sentence later. He also has a 777 slate, which is easy to dodge, but upon hit, scatters your entire deck around the field. Oh no! As for standard attacks, most dangerous but most lucrative are the returning flower turrets. As before, counter the first two attacks ASAP, then take advantage of the third for some free reload time. 
And to really min-max, wait until immediately after each subsequent laser card is removed from play to attack. This deals damage without technically performing a card break, thus keeping the third turret in play longer to bank more reload. Marluxe also has an attack that will blow Sora to the opposite end of the arena and deal a small amount of damage if Sora is too close. The end of the arena is a short walk away, so the damage is the only thing to worry about. Unfortunately, dodging Death Sentence requires Sora to be right in Marluxe's face, so I was too afraid to back up and tended to just tank these hits. Once you reach Phase 2, Phase 2, Marluxe Lush will try to annihilate Sora with an onslaught of new slates. I genuinely have no idea what these do other than basically causing automatic damage, so I gave it my all to counter as many as I could get away with. And that strategy was good enough. With Char finally given a death sentence of his own, the Kingdom Hearts Rechain of Memories one card run is an ultimate mission complete. If you're interested in trying the run yourself, it is highly recommended, but please love yourself and take regular breaks. In fact, love yourself and take regular breaks even if you're playing video games in a totally reasonable way. Trust me, your hands will thank you. And finally, special shout out to Pacey8444, whose video fighting Hollow Marluxe under a similar rule set inspired the full game run. And double finally, if you're interested, I've made a compilation of every boss fight throughout the run, found on my No Commentary channel linked in the description. And triple finally, if you're curious, yes, the bounty is still available even though it doesn't help me in any tangible way. In fact, I'm upping the ante. I'm throwing in a sixth Steam Key, which I guarantee will not work. And quadruple finally, special thanks to all Patreon backers, including a non-42, Leslie McCreera, Lively Leader, Alex Nelson, Jason Ilges is out $10 just because he likes it when Miss Champ reads his name. Rundum Goy, never mind, I can't come up with something better. Game Champ says trans rights are human rights. Salty Sweet, Crustacean Creep, Evil Game Champ is like Bad Evening Nobody, and Unwelcome Forward to WH Facts, the offline on paper board game movie. Nathaniel Kalita, Joel. Britface says, you think changing the vocal tier can stop my love and support? Uh... Arkham, slowest game of chess, black, waiting on white, now I only want to triumph. What's that noise? Ivy Mackie, 8-bit mischievous. Attempted wholesomeness, literal cat, mint, winged cat girl is gay and doesn't go to bed on time. Reblog if you too are gay and or don't go to bed on time. Lily Sap, Shadowfire 638. It's been theorized that the baby Deinonychus lived in trees and may have even been able to glide through the air. Go menacee, game of champ sand, but this will be my last month on this tier. Arigato, mina -san, and play super lesbian animal RPG. Take this kiss upon the brow and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow you are not wrong who deemed that my days have been. This is a name. Doodle Sack 12. Many sentences within program were of a dangerous length and were performed by trained vocal practitioners. Don't try at home. Jen the pink haired cat on twitter.com says meow. Trish Chandler. Objection says there is no Easter Bunny, there is no Tooth Fairy, and there is no Walt Disney Studios. F. Amadon. Quiet Mistrevis. Starknit. Frequently a doofus. Occasionally an idiot. Always a fool. Brisky. Lemon Planter. Ian Beck. Landfair. Pawogany. Gulagogory. Shui. Urundrob. William. Silio. Go Go Coach. Kierkev. Bio Hazard. Hey, is anyone missing an underscore? I found one under the rug. Fluff System, Chris Gooslin, Charles Surrett, Rass Barrel. Sophia has transgender gender. Kirito9979. Um, no, 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 no. Cody Merchant, Seltzer Fountain Man, Madison, Aussie Aussie Aussie, Oi Oi Oi, Touchstone Banana Phone. Kaiser says to please take care of yourself in these trying times. Everyone's favorite trans dragon girl and clan ghost bear Meg Warrior, Aurelia, Moomin Biscuit, trans rights are human rights. STL of the Wild, Ken of Red Lions, a shape shifting mass of cinders and ashes. Duna Nix, Roll the Moth. Well, at least my best friend isn't an uncuttleable. Getsugaru, Love Story Gaming TD. TV. Lex spent $10, so Miss Champ would say Betty Botta bought some butter, but said she, this butter's bitter if I put it in. Celica, Stan's plaid jacket, Eric Williams, Ray Danger, Kelzini, Austin Games, Flame Solace, Macaroni Cat personally endorses running away like a little sissy baby, Harry Stovall, Robin with a Y, Autistic Yu-Gi-Oh, Agathinos though, man, that guy was naive as all get out, really lived up to his name though, swell dude, Haloran, Pokechap, Jinx Shadow, maybe not Zan, pronounced with a Z, Alora Mora, random internet cat is a random cat on the internet and should not under any circumstances be trusted to do non-cat things. Kimber Blee, the gaming bee, OMG Senpai notice me. Daybreak the Auroran Goddess, SOS, the back and shoulder pain is back again with another appearance of soul crushing burnout. It's Caroline. Nicole the Gamer Girl and Gamer Girl. Transient Fay, Tourbit, Zach Crowder, Gaming Medic, Queen Kenda, Zeta is pretty invalid, Zentil, Jane the Jane, Joshua Bennett, Lonely Agent J, Tash, the one free skeleton, Wolfric Grayscale, more like gay scale, Mind Planet 84, Zavi. If I had a nickel for every time Game Champ did a Chain of Memories challenge run, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's W. Can't think of a better name right now, next time we'll be better. Captain Skelly, Grivel. Let's see how Game Champ pronounces Siage, because I'm starting to think I don't know how and it's my own username. Valkyrie Kane and 
Duggery Pleasant, Starfish Attack, Halo Lucky, Kaysen Newburn has been locked aboard the Crazy Train, Idramian, and Ella. Let me know how much this video sucks and how to improve in the comments below. 10,000 Thunderbolts for watching and get out of my house.